So now that we have gotten past um, Halloween, even I have to admit that Christmas is coming, uh, <laughs> which, which takes on a whole other meaning uh, when you work for the church. Uh, uh, in a way, but it, it is it, it is coming whether whether I want it to or not, um, and it's one of those times where you often find yourself thinking back um, on the things uh, of the past. Uh, you know, it's nice thing about holidays is it gives us these little moments in time uh, to remember to. And uh, recently, I was actually thinking back to uh, when I was a kid, uh, and we would come out on Christmas morning. Uh, and there would be, you know, all the presents and the stockings, and there was a rule about what you could do first. You know, you could do stockings before um, you uh, could, you know, before breakfast, you had to wait on everything else till after breakfast. But one of the last things we would always do uh, in our house was there was always um, three cards, one from each of the kids, uh, from um, our grandparents on the tree. And that was almost always the last thing you got to open. Uh, was the card um, from Grandma and Grandpa. Because the card from Grandma and Grandpa, one, would have this loving note written by Grandma uh, about whatever was going on in her life at the moment. I really miss my Grandma's notes. They were fantastic. Um, but inside <laughs> would be a check. And that check would usually be, for at least most of the childhood that I remember, uh, the check was usually for, and I'm not bragging here, $100. And these were late 80s dollars, not like the Mamby Pamby dollars we have today. <laughs> in the age of all this crazy inflation. These were like late 80s dollars in the hands of like an eight, nine, and 10 year old. Um, it was like winning the lottery every Christmas. Um, but it was also a check, right? And it was Christmas. So you had, to, so there was this little ritual that had to happen. You had to wait till the next day the bank was open, which sometimes was the next day and sometimes was the day after that. And then you had to take the check down to the bank. But at that bank, of course, wasn't the same bank that my grandma used many states away. So they would then take the check and put it in your savings account. And then you would have to wait for it to clear. This used to be a thing. Um, and then so some number of days later, you could go back and actually withdraw the money um, that grandma had given you into something you could actually go and spend, uh, you know, what we typically call cash. Uh, at least in the 80s, that's what we did. Um, and, and there was that window, there was like that four-day window in between while you were waiting for this that you would just, all you could do is think about what you wanted to turn that money into, right? And especially if we had to go shopping or anything like that, uh, the kids, we would always run around, um, usually like, you know, like to be honest, like the toy aisle, and we'd just like walk through and say, okay, I might come back and get that. Ooh, I might come back and get that, right? That was always the fun part. Um, of getting, getting the money from grandma and grandpa. It's funny, actually, interestingly, a couple of months ago, my son came up to me, today, uh, came up to me with, uh, with basically the exact opposite problem. He came up to me with this giant wad of cash going, what do I do with this? <laughs> and it's like, you know, the, the online gaming doesn't take cash. <laughs> and I'm like, well, you go to the bank and you deposit it in your account. Um, so uh, yeah, either way, you just, you got problems. Um, but that's the thing, really, um, about money and why money is interesting um, and continues to be a thing that we use today. It's obviously taken different forms in different ways. It used to be just coins. Now we have paper money, um, you know, all that sort of stuff. But money is that has this amazing, almost magical ability to become whatever it is that we want it to become, right? I mean, if, especially anything extra. Now, we all have bills that we have to pay, and there's money that goes in and out that just goes in and out every month because there's the mortgage or the car payment or the power bill or whatever it is. But if we're lucky enough to have a little bit left over um, you know, during, during the month or during the week, we, have this, we live in this amazing time and place where we can turn that into pretty much anything we want to turn it into. If we want to turn it into a nice night out, we can. If we want to turn it into you know, a new uh, you know, piece of equipment for your kitchen, you could do that too. Um, that's why, um, that, that's really what money is for, right? It allows us to take something and turn it into whatever we want to take, put, turn it into. It's probably one of the single greatest inventions that human beings came up with. 
Because if you think about how it must have been before, even though this was a very long time ago, way even earlier than the time of Jesus, because there was plenty of money running around in the time of Jesus, um, way before that, when you basically had to barter for something, right? You had to have something extra, and then somebody else had to have the other thing that you needed extra, and they had to have what you wanted, right? Um, and then you had to agree um, how much you were going to trade for the other thing. This takes a lot of time, right? There weren't a lot of exchanging happening at that time, and it wasn't until we basically introduced this intermediary step where I can trade my extra stuff for money or coins or whatever it is, and you can trade your extra stuff for money and coins and whatever it is, and then we can just buy from each other. Everything got a way more efficient. So for the engineer in me, I love that part of it. Anything that makes the world more efficient just makes my heart sing. I just love it. So we are well and truly, human beings have been using money literally for many thousands of years um, at this point, and had been using it for a good long time by the time we get to the point where Paul is writing to the Corinthians. Um, and so Paul is writing to the Corinthians, and he's writing about money, um, as you can see from the passage. Uh, and he's writing about them because he's in the process of taking up a collection amongst all of the churches um, that he is a part of and has served. So all the churches that he helped set up, he's taking a collection for them, and the collection is actually going to go back to Jerusalem um, and benefit the church in Jerusalem that isn't doing as well. Um, at this point, the actually churches outside of Jerusalem that are mostly composed of Gentiles, you'll remember means everybody not a Jew, um, but it's basically everybody non-Jewish, but the, the, the church is actually outside. Paul's churches are actually doing better um, and um, having more success than the churches even in Jerusalem are. Um, and in fact, um, there is a bit of what we would call, what we would probably call now, uh, like an economic recession or depression happening in Jerusalem at this time. Um, so people in general are just struggling there, um, and some of the people who are struggling um, are their you know, fellow Christians and fellow people who are trying to follow Jesus. So Paul is taking up a collection amongst all of his churches um, to send back to help in the relief of those who are struggling in Jerusalem. And he chooses to do it in, in what at the time is a very interesting way. Because if you notice in the passage, it says he's basically asking them to give to this, this fund that he is collecting, but he's not actually suggesting an amount. He's not saying how much they should give. He's not saying this is your share of what it is we are trying to do. He's not prescribing anything other than people should be generous in whatever way and however much they are called to feel generous. And then, of course, he adds in, and by the way, you should feel generous because it's still Paul, um, which is actually a very different way of doing it. Now, those of us who kind of live and have been around the church today, you know that this is kind of how it works, right? The church is here, and we get to do what we do because the generosity we receive, um, really honestly, from all of you in this place and then and more people globally. At the time Paul was, especially the place he was in Corinth, where everyone else would have been Gentile givers, um, they, most of them would have come from other religious traditions that didn't operate this way. All the other traditions that they came from were probably, probably much more transactional, where um, if you were a priest in that religion or uh, that were around, or you were a religious person, you know, religious worker in that tradition, um, people would come usually to the temple um, expecting to receive some sort of service from you, and for that service you would charge them a fee. So it's much more like going to the store, um, as we would today uh, understand it, than it would be going to church in the way we understand going to church today. So at that point, um, so when, when Paul says, and it goes by quickly, when he says you should give not under compulsion, that's what he's talking about. He's reminding them that there actually is no prescribed, required fee to be part of this thing that Jesus is doing. There is no required payment you have to make before you get to be part of this new thing that God is bringing in the world. You don't actually have to buy your way in to becoming a beloved child of God. You already are. There is no compulsion, as Paul sees it, in the same way that it would be practiced by the other religious traditions of their time. Where when you want something, need something, say somebody in your household is sick and you want them to be healed, you would go to the temple and you could ask uh, for a blessing of healing, but that blessing of healing would come at a cost. 
And if you didn't have the money, you didn't get the blessing. It's just how it worked. Paul says this new thing that we're doing, this thing that we're doing, setting up this new tradition, this new way we know to be to follow Christ, is different. It doesn't come with an upfront fee. That's not how this is going to work. And oh, by the way, most people who were not part of the Christian tradition early in the Christian tradition thought Christians were insane. Part of the reason that early other religious leaders didn't worry about the Christian faith and religion growing up was they were pretty sure that it would simply go bankrupt at some point down the line anyway because they weren't charging any money for what they were doing. They were wrong. I am grateful they are wrong. Uh, But for people at the time, it just really didn't make sense. It didn't make sense that you could actually continue to build and grow um, a faith community um, and do the things that faith communities needed to do um, and provide for things in the way that faith communities needed to provide for each other uh, without doing it the way that everybody else did it. And so here comes Paul, really mimicking Jesus, who comes along and says, well, wait a minute, what if we actually had faith, not only in God, but we had faith in God and faith in the people who were trying to follow God, and that that might actually be able to provide us with enough. That we could, in fact, simply rely on the generosity of people and people's want and desire to be generous with each other. And no doubt, when Paul and other religious leaders, uh, Christian leaders at the time, explained this to other people, they got laughed at a whole bunch. And yet, 2,000 years later, the Christian Christian tradition is still here and thriving, and basically none of those other ones are. I think Paul was on to something. And Paul was on to something because he's really following in the footsteps of Jesus and talking about many of the same things that Jesus talked about. Now, Jesus had a lot of things that he liked to talk about. And if you go through the Gospels, I love this quote. So for those of you who can't see it, it says, I came that you may have money and have it more abundantly. (laughs) Jesus never said that, by the way. But I know that's what people assume, right? I mean, you know, uh, we, we do that. But, but, but it's also kind of funny because Jesus actually did talk about money a lot. It was one of his favorite subjects to talk about. He talked about it all the time. Um, though he also didn't actually talk about money itself all the time. What Jesus talked about all the time was our relationship to money. And I think that's the first thing we kind of hurdle we have to get over as people is Jesus actually never said, and nowhere in Scripture does it say, that money itself is bad, right? Money itself is a tool. But it doesn't say that money itself is bad. It is like many things. It is our relationship to it that can be good or can be bad. It can be life-giving or it can be life-taking. So if you look at when Jesus talks about money, many of the famous stories that we know, whether it's the story of the talents where people are given a certain amount of money and then going to do something with, and there's that one guy who buries the talent in the backyard. Uh, There's the story of the rich young ruler, the rich young ruler who comes and says, Jesus, I want to inherit eternal life. And he lists all these good things that he does. And Jesus says, oh yeah, that's all great. One more thing. Sell everything you own and give your money to the poor. And of course, the rich young ruler doesn't do it. And he goes away. Then, of course, there's the story where Mary comes to Jesus and opens an expensive bottle of perfumes and washes his feet. And Judas goes and says, why did we do that? Why did she do that? We could have taken that money and sold it and given it to the poor. Of course, we know the end of the story that that's not really what Judas was concerned about because Judas got to hold on to the money and was found, a good in, found many opportunities for some of the money to move from one pocket to his own. So Jesus was worried about our relationship with money. He was worried about our tendency and want to either hoard it or fixate on it. He also was concerned about our over-reliance on it. One of my favorite stories in Scripture, um, and it's the one I believe I did here too, Usually, you know, anytime I started out as a new church, uh, one of the first Scriptures I like to preach on is Luke 10, and Luke 10 is the story of Jesus sending the uh, disciples out to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God, and he tells them to do and not do a few things, and one of the things he tells them to not do is not take any money with them. He doesn't want them reliant on that. He wants them reliant. He wants them to be at the, he wants them to see and experience the generosity and the hospitality of people they're going to go to, even if those people are strangers. 
Jesus in that story is an amazing story because Jesus has this expectation that even though these are people the disciples have never met and have probably not yet met Jesus, his expectation is that people, by default, will be generous with people in need. I oftentimes think that the Jesus we find in the Bible is actually far more optimistic about humans than humans tend to be optimistic about humans. And I think Jesus in the Bible and the stories he tells about the church and what it is he's trying to do and what the church and faith and religion should become, he's far more optimistic about that than many of us today can be about faith and religion. And I'm not always sure what to do about that. Now, Jesus would talk about money a lot, and as you can imagine, um, the other person that did that a lot was John Wesley, the founder of Methodism. John Wesley talked about money all the time, um, and he had some simple advice for us on how it is that we ought to approach money. One of the most famous advices that he gives to us is this idea that we should, first first and foremost, earn all we can. This may seem kind of weird to us, right? Isn't that about, isn't, didn't, didn't Jesus say something not like that? I'm like, well, no, actually Jesus didn't. Some people's spiritual gift is making money. Some of you are really, really good at it in a way that I apparently am not, <laughs> right? Um, and, and, and John is first and foremost saying, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It matters how you make that money, right? There are good ways to make money and not so good ways to make money, But if you are able to earn a decent amount at something that you do that gives life to the world, that gives life to you, whatever it is, that is some people's gift, but we will all throughout our lives earn something. And there's nothing wrong, John John says right from the beginning, there's nothing wrong with trying to earn all that you can. What the challenge is, is you can't stop there. And unfortunately, I think we live in a society that is more than happy to embrace the message of earn all you can and then kind of forgets to keep reading the advice that John had for us. Because the next thing he says is that you need to learn, not only earn all you can, but you want to save all you can. Now, save in John's day had a slightly different meaning than it does today. It's not that he's against savings or 401ks or anything like that. It's not about that. But when when John Wesley talked about saving all you can, he was also talking more about the idea of frugality. He was talking about this idea that we should earn all we can, uh, but we we, we should be conscious of where it is that we are then spending what we earn, right? And if we don't need to spend in a certain place or we can spend less on something, maybe we should think about doing that. He, he, he didn't really want us to be uh, you know, overly extravagant in our spending, was really what he was talking about when he says, save all you can. So yes, earn all you can, but that does not mean that you should go, uh, you know, that does not mean that you then should go and you know, spend all you can. Those are not related in his mind. And those first two we can kind of get a hold of, right? Like, we're like, okay, earn all you can, I get that. Save all you can, sure, I understand. You don't know what's coming down the road. You want to have to save up, or you want to you know, not spend money where you don't have to. That's just good common sense. Okay, we get it. And then there's the third one. And then the third one for John was give all you can. Now, he had a lot to say about money. A couple of my favorite quotes of his, and these are mildly translated by me so you don't have to put up with the 17th century English. He gave a sermon called The Use of Money, which is a really good, actually good sermon. And the one thing he notices in there, he says, and he's quoting uh, from 1 Timothy here, he says, the love of money, as we know, is the root of all evil, but not money itself. The love of money, which is what it says in the scripture, is the root of all evil, but not money itself. The problem does not lie in money, but those who use it. It may be used for harmful purposes, but what can't? It likewise can be used well. Money is fully compatible with the best and worst uses. And then he goes on to say even more, something that seems probably even a little bit more provocative to people today, it may still be provocative for us today even more so. He says, money is the, an excellent gift of God and can address the noblest causes. In the hands of God's children, it is food to the hungry, water for the thirsty, and clothing for the naked. It gives travelers and strangers a place to rest, With it, we may provide resources to the widow and a parent to the parentless. We may provide a defense for the oppressed, treatment to the sick, 
and ease the pain of those who are suffering. It can provide tools to the blind and the disabled. John wants us to know what Jesus wanted to know, which is what Paul wanted us to know, which basically throughout Christian tradition we've been trying to remind ourselves of, is it's actually not money or resources or any of the things that we have that are the problem. If there is a problem, it's what we choose to do with them. And do we choose to use the tools as well as we can? Because that is the truth of it. At the end of the day, money is a tool. It is what we do with it that matters most. Now, as I was thinking about the sermon, um, because I'm also a child of the 90s when we actually had to watch the commercials on television, we couldn't just skip forward through them. Uh, there was this commercial that for some reason, 30 years later, um, still sticks in my head. And, and so I actually, because we also lived in the 21st century, I found it on YouTube because everything is on YouTube. Um, so I'm curious if you all remember this commercial as well. Come on. Who's Etienne? Who's Etienne? He's a camel repairman. What? He's a mechanic. Etienne. I hope he takes me down. Oh, he does. Lisa Gold can get you cash more places worldwide than any other car, even American Express. Etienne fix everything. Lisa Gold. So if you couldn't catch it, what the little boy is shouting is there is like, ATM, ATM, fix everything. And they're like, what is he saying? I don't know. Now, first and foremost, we have to acknowledge that this was a from commercial from the early 90s, and it's trading in, let's say, a fair number of stereotypes. Okay, you couldn't, put, you couldn't make this commercial today for good reason. Um, but it's, even as a kid, it's stuck in my head. Um, and the message in it is clear, because that ATM, I mean, first off, that's an ATM from the 90s, right? ATMs today still don't do much of anything interesting other than, you know, give you, take and dispense money. In the 90s, that's really all they did, right? So the message of the commercial is fairly quite forward. It's like, whatever your problem is, money can fix it. And if you, by the way, it's even better if you borrow it from your Visa Cold card. And in a way, the commercial's kind of right, right? I mean, in a way, it is kind of telling a little bit of the truth there. Because again, money is a tool that can become whatever it is we want it to be. Because it, is, because it is, can become clothing for the naked, it can become food for the hungry, it can become all of those things. It is that thing that really can fix a lot of things that are wrong either in our lives or lives of others. Now, it can't fix everything, by any means. Because sometimes what the world really needs or what people really need is something other than what money can buy. Sometimes what you really need, especially when you're going through times of a lot of struggle, is someone just to sit and be with you. Sometimes what you really need is just somebody to be present with you like we talked about last week. And sometimes what you truly need is just a hug. And I hope you're not paying for hugs. And if you are, let me know. I'll give you a hug. <laughs> or I'll find somebody who will. We're all right. We can do that. But there are other things, too, for which money is very useful. Paul doesn't have a problem writing to the Corinth church and asking them to support the work that he, the, the, the collection that he's taking. And he doesn't have a problem because he believes in what that collection is doing. He believes in the work that will be done. He believes that people, uh, the, the people and believers in Corinth should be supporting uh, their fellow Christians, even though those people are hundreds of miles away and they've probably never met. He believes in the mission that is going on. He believes in the ministry that is going on. So Paul doesn't have any problem asking his people to support that mission and that ministry. It's the same reason why I don't have any problem standing up here every Sunday reminding you that there's multiple ways to give to the life of this church. There are giving boxes here. You can always visit johnstown.church slash give. Why? Because I believe in the mission and the ministry and the work that we do in this place and everything that comes out of this place out into the world. One of the things that you have to get used to relatively quickly um, when you decide to either work for the church or especially when you become a pastor is when people find out about it, 
they will tell you all of their problems, which is why most of the time I lie and tell people I'm a plumber. <laughs> and I've told you that before, and it's still true. Uh, but you are going to, that's one of the things that happens is that people do because you realize how many people out there don't have anybody to talk to and speak their problems to. You, the people, the, you start to realize how many people out there do not have a community or people or friends or family surrounding them, supporting them through the hard times. So they just have to keep carrying those hard times with them. And that sometimes the, that they have to carry it for not just days, but weeks, but years. And that those burdens over time get great. I oftentimes, when I hear about a lot of the things that people are going through, I think to myself, or I, ask, even, I will even ask, I wonder if that person has a community of support around them. I wonder if they have a church home. I wonder if there's a community of people who are loving on those folks. I really hope that there is. Because when life gives you the hardest stuff to deal with, things that are almost impossible to get through by yourself, oftentimes the only thing that will help you get through it is a community of people of around you who are there to support you and carry some of the load on your behalf. I believe that that mission and ministry is important. I believe that all everything else we do, I think the flood buckets we do, and I think the working at the food pantry and the preschool downstairs and the children's ministry and the choir that we give and the people we give all these young people an opportunity to sing, I think all of that is fantastic and important too. I think the world needs it. I think our community is better for it. I think this part of the world is better for this church being here and all the work that we do to make it a blessing. But I also believe that the part that intersects us each and every one of us likely the most is the ability to know that there is this place we can go to, that we can fill out a form online and share our joy and concern and trust and know that dozens, if not even more, people will be praying for us and joining us in that. That when the road gets tough, that when the road gets tough, we never have to think that we have to walk it alone. That is something, that is an assurance, that is a gift, and that is a blessing that you literally cannot put a price on. And I don't know that I would be all that interested in living in a world where those places and those people and communities like ours don't exist. I don't think that's a better world than the one we live in now. And in fact, when I look around, what I see is a world that actually needs more communities of care, communities of sport, communities of faith, like we try to be here. There isn't a single person that I have ever met that has encountered this particular group of people who hasn't come away impressed. And it's not that our technology and it's not my sermons or it's not any of the music, though sometimes it's the music, that they are necessarily impressed by. What I constantly hear comments about for people, especially those who visit with us for any length of time, is the way that we care, the way that we love, the way that we are open, the way that we are hospitable, the way that we seem to generally be interested in the life and in the welfare of each other and those that we meet. That is not every church. I wish it was. It should be. That was Jesus' intention. But I do believe it is our church, which is why I don't have any problem reminding you that in order to be that for each other, we do have some bills to pay around here from time to time. And we can only do that because of the generosity you show us. Because I don't want, nor am I able, to start charging a cover charge at the door. <laughs> we gave that up 2,000 years ago with Paul. Hey, darn. <laughs> <laughs> Says the treasurer, by the way. Instead, we continue to have what Christians have always had. Trust and faith in God and trust and faith in each other. So here in a moment, we're going to come forward to the table.
We're going to come to the table behind me that has been set in the same way that Christian tables have been set for 2,000 years. We come to actually get to taste and touch and feel the grace that God has for us in the form of the bread and the juice. It is a free gift. It is something given to each and every one of us, whether you're a member of this church or not. Whether this is your first time or your millionth time, whether you really understand what it is that's being offered to you or maybe you're not quite sure what it is yet, either way, it's there for you because God's grace is there for you. Our, his forgiveness is there for you. It does not come with a price tag. That's not how it works. In the same way, the love and the grace that we have for each other is there for you. That does not come with a price tag either because I couldn't possibly charge you what that's actually worth. Instead, we all are just given the same request and calling that Christians have always been given. To remember where we've been blessed. To remember where God's been generous with us. And in turn, be generous with each other. Amen.